In this presentation, we will take a look at Matthew chapter 4, and then the book of Luke chapter 4 through 5. As always, I would read the chapters before listening to the presentation, so you'll get all the background and detail of what's going on, and you'll probably gain more out of it. Again, those who are listening to audio-only format, this is a YouTube presentation where I have slides, and you can go to my YouTube channel, Coming Unto Christ, by Michael S. Clough, if you want to see the slides that have all the quotes and different things that I present here. Let's start with Matthew chapter 4, verses 1 through 11. Jesus is tempted of the devil. Let's take a look at the temptations of the Savior and what we learn from this event. First of all, Lucifer and the law of temptation. It must needs be, meaning it is mandatory, that there is opposition in all things. That's 2 Nephi 2.11. Men must have a choice. They must be able to choose. There must be opposites. They must have agency. And agency can only be presented when there are opposites and enticements by those opposites. They must be free to worship the Lord or to follow Satan. All this is imperative. It is inherent in the whole plan of salvation. And unless men have the agency to choose to do good and work righteousness, and in fact do so, they cannot be saved. There is no other way. There can be no light without darkness, no life without death, no heat without cold, no virtue without vice, no sense without insensibility. There can be no righteousness without wickedness, no joy without sorrow, no reward without punishment, no salvation without damnation. If these things did not exist, if there were no, no no opposites, if there were no opposition in all things, if there were no agency, if men were not free to choose one course or another, such would, as Lehi says, destroy the wisdom of God and his eternal purposes, and indeed should be the case, and it is possible that it could be, then all things must have vanished away. So there is a law of temptation which involves the law of opposition. The Savior as a mortal was subject to the same laws of trials and testing that encompass all mortals. He must go through the same things we all go through. Mortality is a probationary state, one in which all men must be subject to the wiles and enticings of Satan. Worship God or submit to Satan. That is all that life is about. That is what our agency involves. I have the right to choose one or the other. I do not have the ability nor the right to choose the consequence of my action or what kind of consequences if consequences come. That is not agency. Agency is I can either choose the way of Christ or the way of Satan. That is up to me. So, let's begin. I am going to use the Joseph Smith translation of Matthew because he adds a lot of things that are missing in the King James Version. Joseph Smith, Matthew, chapter 4, verses 1 through 2. Then was Jesus led up of the Spirit into the wilderness to be with God. Okay, so we get from the Joseph Smith translation that he goes in the wilderness to be with God. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights and had communed with God, see that's added in the Joseph Smith translation, he was afterwards in hunger and was left to be tempted of the devil. So he is going there to commune and to get closer to his Father in heaven and to re most likely to receive instruction from him. The Joseph Smith translation of Mark, chapter 1, verses 10 through 11, speaking of the same period, says, And immediately the Spirit took him into the wilderness, and he was there in the wilderness forty days, Satan seeking to tempt him, and was with the wild beast, and the angels ministered unto him. And so Mark adds the insight that angels came to Christ and ministered, probably taught, and, and 
gave comfort or whatever and blessed him. Brother Eller Bruce McConkey writes the following concerning this. If there are eternal laws by obedience to which men see visions and commune with the infinite, what glorious communion with heaven should we find in the life of the one who obeyed all the laws ever given to, mort to mortals? If the veil has been rent for lesser men, and they have seen inconceivable glories and heard unspeakable words, what should we suppose was seen and heard by the greatest man? Do you see what it's saying? Can you imagine what kind of outpouring of the Spirit, what kind of visions and revelations and things that Christ must have received? If more to us mere mortal prophets have received such great outpourings of the Spirit, I, can, I cannot imagine what this 40 days must have been like for the Savior and the things he must have experienced that was in preparation for his ministry and his mission, especially to suffer, bleed, and die for us. Back to finishing Elder McConkie's quote. Surely the spiritual stature of the man Jesus was such that for 40 days the lions and the wild beasts treated him as they did Daniel. Surely the visions of eternity were open to his view as they were to Paul and Joseph Smith. Surely he saw all that was seen by Enoch and Moses and Moriakimer. Surely there was purpose and preparation, refinement and testing, growth and development during this period when our Lord's body was made subject to his spirit. Fasting and prayer and pondering and visions and revelations prepare men for the ministry. It was no different except in degree where the preparation of our Lord Jesus was concerned. Even he had to prepare the same way we must prepare. Just the degree and the, the speed in which he prepared was different than the way we do. It would be interesting if someday we can get an account of all that took place during these 40 days and what glorious and marvelous things took place, maybe someday. Matthew chapter 4 verse 3 then says, And when, and when the tempter came to him, okay, this is after his great outpouring of the Spirit, these great angels ministering to him, these great revelations and visions and all of this communing with his Father in heaven. Then the tempter came to him and said, If thou be the Son of God, command that these stones may be made bread. When we commit ourselves to the Lord's cause and for covenant to forsake the world and serve the Lord at all costs, then it is that we are tested in all things to see if we will abide, come what may. It is then the devil tries even harder to lead us astray. It also appears that it seems to be when we are at our most vulnerable moments is when Satan will seize his opportunity. So don't be surprised or shocked that if you make a greater commitment to become more consecrated, more dedicated to our Savior, that Satan also becomes more dedicated to your destruction. Don't let that throw you, that greater influence by him will come into your life to try to sway you. He is not going to let us go just without a fight. And so know as we try to better ourselves, Satan will also try better to not let us better ourselves. And why shouldn't the Savior provide himself with bread? Have you ever thought about that? His fasting's over. There's a time to fast and there's a time to eat. There's a time to break your fast. So there's nothing wrong with him eating. Okay, why shouldn't he provide himself with bread? The time has come to break his fast. Elabrus Armaconki writes this following great insight. Why not? Had not Jehovah provided manna, which is bread from heaven, to all Israel six days a week for 40 years, lest they die or hunger in the wilderness? He had provided bread miraculously for others. 
so that they would survive physically. Why should he not provide for himself miraculously? There was nothing wrong in that. He had done it for 40 years, provided bread miraculously for people. And so there's, and, and just as far as that goes, there's nothing wrong with that. Back to Brother McConkie. Was it not the will of the Father that his son now eat and regain his physical strength? And if Israel was fed by bread from heaven, when no other food was available, why would not Israel's chief citizen, Christ, receive food in the same way? What would be wrong with duplicating for one day a miracle that had occurred on more than 12,000 days when Moses and Aaron led Israel from Egypt to the very Jordan whose waters he had been recently been immersed? What would be wrong with that? Well, absolutely nothing except for one point. Elder McConkie continues. Actually, there was no reason save one. Why food, food should not have been provided miraculously, which shows how devilish devised the tempting challenge was. And for aught we know, it may have been so provided at a later time. The one reason was... Lucifer had made the providing of food for Jesus' hungry body a test of his divinity. If thou be the Son of God, do this thing. It was as though he had said, Cut off your arm and restore it, and then I will believe you are the Son of God and have the power you seem to think you have. Of course he could turn stones into bread. In less than two months he would turn water into wine in Cana. And not long after, thereafter, on two separate occasions, he would multiply loaves and fishes so that thousands could eat, which is to say he would make food out of the elements that surround us. But here Lucifer was challenging him to glory in his divinity, and to prostitute his powers. He was demanding that he prove something that needed no proof. Jesus knew, and Satan knew. Both had perfect knowledge on the point, that our Lord was the Son of God. There was no need to prove it by turning stones into bread even though he had the power, and even though the time was at hand when it was proper for him to eat and be filled. Indeed, if he, Christ, had yielded to Lucifer, turning the stones into bread, it would have indicated a doubt in his own mind of his divinity. It would have shown he felt a need to prove that which needed no proof. Do you see how good Satan is and how subtle this temptation was and how sly? At first, it seemed, well, yes, it's time to break my fast. I have provided food miraculously for others. There's nothing wrong in that. There is no law in heaven I'm breaking. But there is a problem with the need to prove by some divine miracle that he is the Christ when he already knows that. And Lucifer knows he is the Christ. Satan is good at what he does. You do not want to play on his playground or you will lose. The reply, Matthew 4, 4. But he, Christ, answered and said, It is written, Men shall, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. The Savior was quoting Deuteronomy chapter 8, verses 2-3, through 3, which read, and thou shalt remember all the way which the Lord thy God led thee these forty years in the wilderness, to humble thee and to prove thee to know what was in thine heart, whether thou wouldest keep his commandments or no. This, all of this is a type of the fasting and struggle of Jesus for forty days in the wilderness of his fast. The Savior must also prove that he is willing to have a heart that is only centered on the Father, and that he is willing to do all that his Father commands him to do. 
So the 40 years in the wilderness, the 40 days fasting is a type, the wilderness is a type of what the Savior is going through. Finishing now Deuteronomy 8. And he humbleth thee, and suffered thee to hunger, and fed thee with manna, which thou knowest not, neither did thy fathers know, that ye might that he might make thee known that man doth not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of the Lord doth man live. For the Israelites to survive in the wilderness, they had to live and follow every word that came from Jehovah through Moses. They had to learn to live by the word of God. The Savior is tells Satan, I am no different. I will live by every word that proceedeth forth from my Father, God. That is, even as Israel relied upon Jehovah for their daily bread, lest they die physically, so they must rely upon him for the word of God, which is spiritual bread, lest they die spiritually. Those who make the search for earthly bread their chief concern lose sight of eternal values, fail to feed their spirits, die spiritually, and lose their souls. By choosing from the whole Old Testament the very words that show the relative worth of bread from the earth and bread from heaven, Jesus' triumph, triumph over Lucifer is complete. His appetites will be kept within the bounds set by divine standards. And so too we must learn how to keep our appetites within the bounds of divine standards. Joseph Smith Matthew chapter 4 verses 5 through 6. Then Jesus was taken up into the holy city and the Spirit setteth him on the pinnacle of the temple. See, that's different than the King James. It says the devil did. The devil isn't going to take the Savior anywhere and set him anywhere. No, the Spirit taketh him up and setteth him on the pinnacle of the temple. What purpose, we do not know. It was must have been to teach him something. That part we have not been given yet. Verse 6, then the devil came unto him and said, after the Spirit has taught what was needful for the Savior to learn, then the devil came unto him and said, if thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down, for it is written, he shall give his angels charge concerning thee, and in their hands he shall bear thee up, lest at any time thy dust thy foot against a stone. Lucifer now is quoting scripture. Do you see how quickly Satan adapts? and adjust his temptations to our situations. Again, do not play on the devil's playground. You will lose. This is how good he is. He is quoting Psalms 91, verses 11 through 12, which say, For he shall give his angels charge over thee. He, the Father, shall give his angels charge over thee, Christ, to keep thee in all thy ways. They shall bear thee up in their hands, lest thou dash thy foot against a stone. So this is prophesied. This is a prophecy, a messianic prophecy. Again, Elder Bruce R. McConkie just makes some great insights and writes the following. Now Lucifer tempts him with reference to a spiritual matter. If our Lord is choosing to put the things of God's kingdom ahead of the things of the world, which the last temptation he just showed that he was, then let him cast himself down, for he will then fulfill a scripture and triumph before the people in a spiritual field. You see what the McConkie is saying? Do you see how subtle and beautiful, not beautiful, but in a sense, that how good Satan is? Look, certainly you want to do spiritual things then. Then this is prophesied. Then fulfill prophecy. You will fulfill prophecy. And the things of the Spirit. What a subtle temptation. Continuing Elder McConkie's quote. If thou be the Son of God, the tempter says, then cast thyself down in the midst of the worshiping throng. If thou art the Messiah, surely thou wilt fulfill this messianic prophecy. 
How else can it be fulfilled but by you on this occasion? And what a beginning for thy ministry! All men shall hear of the marvelous things thou hast done. They will flock to hear your message, and you will be able to accomplish what you were sent to do. This is the very thing the Messiah must do to provide his divinity, and it must be done to commence your ministry. If thou be the Son of God, thou shalt surely cast thyself down. Now, do it now. This is the time. This is your great hour. See, Satan will get us to think that what we are doing is necessary and proper in some way fulfills something. He will do that to us. He will warp us and deceive us so much in beginning to think that the thing he's tempting us is actually a good thing. Boy, we must be careful. You see how deceptive he is here with Satan? Surely you want to fulfill scripture, don't you? You said you were interested in things of the Spirit. Well, here is a prophecy. Fulfill it now. It must be done now, in this way. Matthew chapter 4, verse 7, Jesus said unto him, it is written again, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. What does it mean to tempt God? Here's what I think it means. We tempt God when we seek confirmation and we do not have real intent. What I mean by that is we seek a spiritual confirmation from our Father in Heaven and from the Holy Ghost of some spiritual truth, but we have no intention of living it. We just want our, an answer out of curiosity. God does not answer prayers out of curiosity. What does the Book of Mormon promise say in Moroni chapter 10, verses 4 through 5? If you have real intent, then I'll manifest the truth of it unto you. What are your intentions? Do you intend to follow me and live my commandments if I give you a witness of the truth? If not, I am not going to give it. You're just tempting me. God is not to be tempted, brothers and sisters. We tempt God when we seek confirmation and we do not have real intent to live it. In Deuteronomy 6.16, it says, Ye shall not tempt the Lord your God as ye tempted him in Massah. So this is an example of what I was just talking about. It was at Massah that the children of Israel, dying of thirst and perishing for want of water, as they supposed, demanded of Moses that he prove that the Lord was with them, by providing water for them and their cattle. It was then that Moses smote the rock and the water gushed out, because they tempted the Lord, saying, Is the Lord among us or not, Moses? Look how well that turned out when they tempted God. They all died in the wilderness and were not saved. For the second time, our Lord's victory over Lucifer was total and triumphant. Seductive was as the appeal was, he would not yield. His divinity was not to be proved by a plunge from the temple pinnacle, nor was his ministry to be announced by any such dramatic occurrence. He was his own witness, and the people, as in all ages, must come and hear a prophet's voice and choose for themselves whether to believe or to rebel. And so it is the same with us. The next temptation, Joseph Smith translation, Matthew chapter 4, verses 8 through 9. And again, Jesus was in the spirit, and it, the spirit, taketh him up into an exceedingly high mountain, and showeth him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them. You see how that was changed, what the original wording was supposed to be? Satan, again, doesn't take Jesus into a mountain and show him all the kingdoms. No, the Spirit does, again, probably for some teaching purpose, which we do not have. And so after the teaching experience, then, and the devil came unto him again and said, All these things will I give thee if thou wilt fall down and worship me. 
Now, this is an interesting temptation, isn't it? Why would the Son of God, who will inherit all things his Father hath, be interested in what Satan has to offer? Why does Lucifer offer, a, that should be offer, I'm sorry, offer a handful of dust, as it were, to him who has created everything and whose destiny it was to inherit all things and to have all power in heaven and on earth? Uh, that, that's that's a great question. That's all he's offering is a handful of dust if you're going to inherit everything in eternity. Well, Elder Bruce R. McConkie writes the following and makes some great points. In practical, in practical reality, this must have been the crowning test of the three. Now, you see, I would think, oh, this, this must have been the easiest one. Jesus can obviously see that, God, you're offering me a handful of dust compared to what my Father is going to give me if I'm faithful. But look at what McConkie says. In practical reality, this have, must have been the crowning test of the three. Jesus was a mortal man, remember? He has part mortality in him. And every mortal has planted in his heart the desire for wealth and power. One of the great purposes of mortality is to bridle this desire and to keep it under control. One of the great tests down here, brothers and sisters, is learning how to educate our desires and to have our desires coincide with the desires of our Father in heaven and his will. Continuing Elder McConkie. Cain slays Abel to gain his flocks and herds. Esau sells his birthright for a mess of pottage. Joseph's brothers sell him to the Ishmaelites for a few, few pieces of silver. Judas plants the traitor's kiss for 30 pieces of silver. Ananias and Sophria hold back a part of the price of their property and lose their souls in the process. Such has always been the way with mortals. Women sell their virtue for a few baubles. Politicians sell their souls to be elected to office. Generals sell their lives of their soldiers to satisfy their vanity. Mer <coughs> excuse me. Merchants sell their integrity for a few paltry pence. Such is the way of the world. And since our Lord's temptations were real and a part of his necessary trials and tests, we cannot do other than suppose that all the kingdoms and wealth and power of Satan's world must have seemed desirable to him. Men have the potential of becoming joint heirs with him of all that his father hath, and yet they sell their souls for naught. Why should he be subject to any less testing? These stories are real. It's just not an automatic. We just sometimes read these, I think, in a vacuum and think, oh, of course he's going to overcome temptation. He's Christ. He's perfect. No, he had mortal feelings and emotions and desires that he also had to curb and learn how to control. And as he says, this must have seemed desirable to him, or it wouldn't have been a temptation. And Brother McConkie is intimating this was the greatest test of all. Frederick Farrar, the great 1800s Bible scholar, writes the following concerning this and how we are tempted with the things of the world. He says, There are some that will say that we are never tempted with kingdoms. It may well be, for it needs not be when less will serve. It, it was Christ only that was thus tempted. In him lay an heroical mind, he, heroical mind that could not be tempted with small matters. But with us it is nothing so, for we esteem more basely of ourselves. We set our wares at a very easy price. He, Lucifer, may buy us even dagger, dugger cheap. He need not carry us so high as the mount. The pinnacle is high enough. Yea, the lowest steeple in all the town would serve the turn. 
or let him but carry us to the leads and gutters of our own houses. Nay, let us but stand in our windows or our doors. If he will give us so much as we can see there, he will tempt us thoroughly. We will accept it and thank him too. A matter of half a crown or ten goats or a pair of shoes or some such trifle will bring us on our knees to the devil. We are tempted by far so much less. We just see what's in our neighbor's driveway, and we sometimes lust and covet because I don't have a nicest home or nicest car or the things that he has. Brother Farrar is right. We sell ourselves cheap, very cheap, if we are not careful. Joseph Smith Translation, Matthew 4.10 Then said Jesus unto him, Get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and serve him, and him only shalt thou serve. You notice, brothers and sisters, in each one of these, the Savior combats temptation with Scripture. Do you and I know the Scriptures well enough? Are we studying the scriptures daily so that they can be written upon our hearts so that we could quote them in the time of our temptations? How well is our knowledge of doctrine and scripture? Or can Satan easily influence us because we are not feasting upon the words of Christ? So that he may fulfill all righteousness, Jesus was tempted it gave him the experiences he needed to work out his own salvation. And it prepared him to sit in judgment upon his erring brethren, who in a lesser degree are tried and tested as he was. That he was tempted above any mortal can be seen from Mosiah 3.7, which says, And lo, he suffereth temptations, and pain of body, hunger, thirst, and fatigue, even more, then can man suffer, except it be unto death. Truly Christ has suffered more than any of us will ever, ever imagine. Thus he is the great exemplar. The Apostle Paul gives some of the best ex expositions as to why Jesus was tempted and suffered from the book of Hebrews. Here's a few verses from some different chapters. It becameth him for whom are all things, and by whom are all things, in bringing many sons into glory, to make the captain of their salvation perfect through suffering. Even Christ had to suffer. Just as we must too to learn. Christ learned through suffering. Wherefore in all things it behooveth him to be made like unto his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. For in that he himself hath suffered being tempted, he is able to succor them that are tempted. He understands full well our temptations, therefore he can help us. Seeing that then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. And then one last one. Though he were a son... Yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered. And being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. Just as I must too learn obedience by the things which I suffer or by the things which I experience, so too Christ learned by the things which he suffered and the experiences he had. Well, let's go to Luke chapter 4 now. In Luke chapter 4 is when the Savior returns to his hometown, Nazareth, and he walks into a synagogue on the Sabbath day and preaches and quotes Isaiah chapter 61, verses 1 through 2. 
This is Luke chapter 4, verses 16 through 19, as he quotes these verses that are about himself. So I'm just going to take a look at the quote of Isaiah and what they mean and how they applied to the Savior. Jesus most likely read in Hebrew the passage on the Isaiah scroll and then translated the passage into Aramaic, since that was the common language of the day. All the scriptures were in Hebrew. During this time of the Savior's ministry, the people spoke Aramaic. So he would have read the Hebrew, and then for them, as it says, <clears throat> Hebrew was used only in reading the scriptures. This would then he would have translated into Aramaic because they wouldn't have understood the Hebrew, and, and, unless you knew the scriptures and had studied them. And most of the common people would have most likely not have done that. And so then he in Aramaic then gives a summary, you know, and says, "This is what I've I've read." This would account for the difference between Isaiah's record in the Old Testament and the statements given by Jesus as recorded by Luke. If you read Isaiah chapter 61 verses 1 through 2 and then the Savior saying, I'm reading from Isaiah, there is a difference. That because when he tells it to them, he's telling it to them in Aramaic. So let's take a look at the Isaiah quote and what it has to do with what is Jesus teaching. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, meaning being pure and without sin, Jesus always had the Spirit with him. There is not a day... He did not know what it was like to have the Spirit of God with him. It was always with him. He hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor, meaning to the meek, those who voluntarily humble themselves, to the God-fearing, to those who seek righteousness, which in general are the poor among men. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, Meaning, let those whose spirits are depressed come unto him, and he will give them peace. Are there those who are crushed with the weight of their sins, who carry burdens of despair? Let them come unto Christ. He will bear their burdens if they will repent. Though Christ, through, though Christ's own heart be broken, yet shall all those who believe in him be healed. He shall heal men spiritually, even as you have seen him heal them physically. He hath sent me to preach deliverance to the captive. Meaning Christ's words deliver men from the captivity of sin and the bondage of iniquity. He proclaims the liberty to the sin-shackled soul. By his word, the everlasting gospel that he preaches, Men in mortality and those in spirit prison are made free. He has sent me to preach recovering of sight to the blind, meaning I am sent by the Father not only to proclaim how deliverance from sin shall be found, but to preach the recovering of spiritual sight to those who are blind spiritually. Through me they shall see out of obscurity and out of darkness. He hath sent me to set at liberty them that are bruised, meaning those who are bruised and bound and beaten and shackled in the dungeons of hell shall come forth. The word has gone forth, the prison doors shall open, be it for the prisoners of sin in this life, or as another prophet has called them, the prisoners of hope in the life to come. That is quoting Zechariah chapter 9, verse 12. He hath sent me to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. Meaning, this is the year. This is the set time. Salvation is near. I am he. My word is truth. Come and walk in the light of the Lord. Now is the time and the day of your salvation. This is the acceptable year. This day is the scripture fulfilled in your hearts, meaning they apply to me. I am the one of whom the prophet spoke. I am he. I am the Messiah. Where such a witness is born, there are only two possible responses. One is complete acceptance. 
The other is complete rejection. And unfortunately, we know what most of the Jewish people do. They reject. Luke chapter 4, verses 23 through 27. Jesus is rejected at Nazareth. He proclaims a great prophecy and said, I am the prophecy. Today it is fulfilled. And they reject it. In a sense, they were saying, We know he cannot be the Messiah, for he is Joseph's son. But what of the miracles? Can it be that he has performed them? And if the reports are true, why doesn't he show us, his friends and associates of many years, the same signs and wonders he has shown others? Christ did no miracles in Nazareth. See, that's what they're complaining about. Evidently because they had not sufficient faith. Jesus, reading their thoughts and feeling the sense of the meeting, yet remaining in complete command of the situation, continued his sermon. Ye shall surely say unto me this proverb, Physician, heal thyself. Whatsoever we have heard done in Capernaum, do also here in the country, he said. See, do the miracles you've done in Capernaum. You have performed miracles in Cana and Capernaum, but none here, and yet you are a native of Nazareth. Why can't we see a sign, some great exhibition of your purported power? Don't you know that charity begins at home, that unless the physician heals himself of his own diseases, we cannot believe that he has power to heal others? Do you hear the faithlessness in their voices? And what they were asking. No wonder he could do no miracles there. Just as in the day of Elijah saving the widow woman of Serapata and Elisha healing Naaman the Syrian, because they had faith in God, though they were not of the house of Israel, those in Nazareth will also be passed over because of their lack of faith in Christ. Thus they sought to kill him. Remember, they either had to accept him. His miracles and his teachings were so great. You either accept me for who I am, or you must kill me for who I am. And in Luke 4, 29-30, they sought to kill him. We will do the same, brothers and sisters, if we do not have faith in Christ. We will also apostatize and will seek spiritually to kill Christ. Well, let's go to Luke chapter 5. We'll consider three miracles that the Savior, the leper, the Peter catching a whole drought of fishes that it swamps their boat, and then the four men who bring their paralyzed friend and, and let him down through the roof. Miracles were performed not alone for the benefit and blessing of the suffering Israel, whose body was affected, but as a witness to the growing group of opponents that he whom they opposed came from God and had divine power. The wicked and rebellious in Israel, word upon word and miracle upon miracle, were being left without excuse. Their sins were being bound securely upon their own heads. The light they were rejecting was shining forth everywhere in word and in deed. So the miracles not only helped those who they were performed upon, but it was also condemning those who opposed Christ because it was declaring who he was and they would not accept it. Let's take a look first at Luke chapter 5, verses 4 through 6. The word nevertheless, a very significant word that shows up two times. Well, two times that are very significant, and this is one of them. This is when Jesus is at the Sea of Galilee, and he is preaching, and after he has preached, he says this. Now when he had left speaking, he said unto Simon, Launch out into the deep. And let down your nets for a drought. And Simon answering said unto him, Master, we have toiled all night and have taken nothing. We, we are tired. There are no fish today. There is nothing there. 
we have spent all night. But look what he... <clears throat> I have times of given up just at that point. What? You want me to read the Book of Mormon again? President Hinckley? President Nelson? Whatever prophet asks. What? I just finished it. You want me to do what again? You want me to minister to whom again? Savior, we have toiled all night. Now look. Nevertheless, as tired as Peter and his companions were, at thy word, I will let down the net. And when they had done, they enclosed a great multitude of fishes, and their net brake. Jesus or Peter would never have seen that miracle unless he was willing to say, nevertheless. The same will be true of us, brothers and sisters. Do we have the ability, when we don't want to, we're tired, we're down, we're distraught, we're depressed, we're suffering from anxiety, whatever it may be, a substance abuse, abuse from others, to still say, nevertheless, Jesus, I will do whatever you ask. Nevertheless will be key in our miracles, being able to say, nevertheless. Let's go to Luke chapter 5, verses 12 through 15, the healing of the leper. Leprosy. It began with little specks on the eyelids and on the palms of the hand and gradually spread over different parts of the body, bleaching the hair white wherever it showed itself, crusting the affected parts with shiny scales and causing swellings and sores. From the skin, it slowly ate its way through the tissues to the bones and joints and even to the marrow, rotting the whole body piecemeal. The lungs, the organs of speech, and the hearing and the eyes were attacked in turn till at last consumption or dropsy brought welcome death. That's from Cunningham Geike, the great biblical scholar of the 1800s from the life and words of Christ. A hideous, horrible disease that ate you alive from the inside out. Well, Elder McConkie writes the following. Leprosy in biblical times, in addition to its desolating physical effects, was looked upon as the symbol of sin and uncleanliness, signifying that as this evil disease ate away and destroyed the physical body, so sin eats away and corrupts the spiritual side of man. This did not mean that the diseased born by any individual attested that he was a worse sinner than his fellows, only that the disease itself was a symbol of the ills that will befall the ungodly and rebellious. It had been chosen as such a symbol, however, because it was considered to be the worst of all diseases, one that could not be cured except by direct divine invention, just like sin cannot be cured except by direct divine intervention. Continuing, Brother McConkie. Here is a man of faith. There is no question as to whether Jesus can heal him. Only will the great healer use his power in this case. Indeed, here is a man of great faith, for it would have taken an almost abound spirit, abounded, unbounded spiritual assurance to have the confidence of a restoration of health from a disease so dread. And was it not the recognized teaching of all the rabbis of the day that leprosy was incurable? For such an affliction to leave the flesh of man had scarcely been seen since the day since the day of Naaman the Syrian from the Old Testament. So here is a miracle. Just as I can heal leprosy, I can heal your sick souls that eat you alive. And unless you come unto me and repent, it will consume us, brothers and sisters, if we do not turn to Christ, to have our sin of leprosy, spiritually speaking, cleansed from us through repentance 
and the atonement of Jesus Christ. Luke chapter 5, verses 17 through 16 now, are the four men who bring their friend who is paralyzed on the bed and let him down through the roof, saying, Thy sins are forgiven thee. Elabrusan McConkey provides this very interesting insight that I had never considered. Listen to what he says. If Jesus should say to him first, Be thou made whole, and then thy sins are forgiven thee, the miraculous performance would be another example of his divine power, of which there already was an uncounted number, and the physically decrepit person would, of course, be healed physically and spiritually. Such is a possible course of procedure. See, I never thought about that the, the order in which Christ says this was deliberate and on purpose to make a point. He could have said, I heal you, and then, oh, by the way, thy sins are also forgiven. But that's not what he does. Continuing, Brother McConkie. On the other hand, if Jesus should first forgive the man's sins, since none but God can forgive sins, such an act would be an announcement that he was God. Then, if he commanded the sick person to rise up and walk, it would be proof that his claim to divinity was true. Isn't that a beautiful insight? That's why he says it the way he does. Thy sins were forgiven thee. And remember, so the Pharisees murmur, oh, only God can forgive sins, like, duh, no kidding, Sherlock. Who do you think I am? See, he declares his divinity, and then the miracle backs up his declaration that I am the Son of God. The scribes and Pharisees are in a bind. None but God can forgive sins. And if this man is not God, then the words he has spoken are blasphemy. And according to divine law, the penalty for such is death. If, however, this man is the Messiah, then the prerogative he has assumed is proper, and it is within his province to loose on earth and have it loosed eternally in the heavens. Messiah can forgive sins because Messiah is God. It appears that some of the miracles Jesus performs puts them in the situation whether they either have to accept Christ as the Son of God or kill him because of blasphemy. And we know which course they chose. They chose to find blasphemy in the sinless Son of God. That is how deceived Satan got them. They said they found him blasphemous, and that is why we're going to kill you. How could a sinless person blaspheme? That is so much control Satan had over their hearts. Well, in James chapter 5, verse 14 through 15, James makes an interesting statement. He says, Is there any sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the church, and let him pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith shall have the sick. I'm sorry. And the prayer of faith shall save the sick. And the Lord shall raise him up, and if he hath committed sins, they shall be forgiven him. That's an interesting thing to ponder. In closing, just a few words in these chapters in Luke, we hear the devils testifying that Christ is the Son of God, and Jesus silencing the devils. He tells them to be quiet, hush, don't say anything. The reason he's doing that, brothers and sisters, is the Savior does not need their testimony. Of course they know who he is. They know who he was in the pre-earth life. They know he's the Son of God. They were there, and so they declare it. But Jesus silenced them because what, in essence, he is saying, I do not need the testimony of devils. You be quiet. I will not accept any testimonies from Satan and his minions. That's why he's silencing them. We need none of that. We need no witness from them. We receive our witness through the Holy Ghost 
and the Spirit. Thank you for watching. If you enjoyed the presentation, hit the like button and consider subscribing to my channel.